I have a few broad questions that I like to ask any family. The first is, what do you think is happening? Because some families will have a very good understanding of their son, daughter, cousin, um, partner, and they might just say, well, this is a relapse of schizophrenia. So when obtaining collateral from a family, really my first step is I, I look at my history and I think, what are the gaps? So what can't the, what can't the client give me? When you call family, have an idea in mind of what you want. So is that to update them on progress? Are you trying to work out if the patient's safe to go home or if they're willing to pick the patient up and take them home? Or do you need to know background information? And when you're thinking about background information, you should be looking at your patient and thinking, what is your differential diagnosis for this patient? And then you're going and fishing for the symptoms of those things. So you look for signs of major mental illness, like previous history of mania or depression, previous histories of psychosis, substance use, and more recent symptomology. So things like behavioral change, social changes, activity changes, things that the family may have noticed or worried about and specific concerns few things one is to be basically finding out um, and I think a lot of JMOs sometimes struggle with I don't know what to ask the patient when you call them usually some of the pair some of the carers like to vent a bit so let them vent a bit just support them through that and then that's when you can just start asking your questions and saying that what was the first things you started noticing wrongs and um, what was happening how is he the first thing you'd ask is like how is he when he's well or when was the last time he was well what was he like and if someone's into, and we all have idiosyncrasies, we all have weird things that we do and that need not be considered a part of mental illness if that's how the person always was. And when did they notice a change? That's, that's one thing, what sort of change it is. The usual things that are difficult is obviously developmental history, early developmental history. None of us will have a recollection of ourselves and also what has happened, say, in the hours and days before presentation. So they're the two main gaps that you have to fill. And what people have to understand is people will frequently brush over the developmental history. But <clears throat> people's pre-morbid personality traits, despite whatever illness occurs after that, will inform their current presentation. So it's very helpful to get an understanding of what a person's temperament and pre-morbid personality is prior to the onset of illness, because that will help with your formulation. What were they like before they became unwell? You know, have they been taking their medications? What's their impression? Have there been any stressors recently? Any drug and alcohol use? Anything irrational or bizarre or out of the ordinary that you've noticed? Um, but I. A collateral history is, is just so fundamental and so important and um, I think that's a really good opportunity to start building relationships with the family members of the patient. Uh, so it's absolutely vital. So that would be my advice. Go gently you know, and try and build that relationship with them. Um, by and large most people are quite forthcoming with information especially to help uh, a friend or loved one. but. There are occasions where either family members or uh, are uncontactable, burnt out, don't really want to provide care. That's when you need to resort, um, resort to relying on the mental health follow-up the patients received, as well as GP and other allied health that may have had some input. And that can be a wealth of information on its own. I have a few broad questions that I like to ask any family. The first is, what do you think is happening? Because some families will have a very good understanding of their son, daughter, cousin, um, partner, and they might just say, well, this is a relapse of schizophrenia. And we've seen this before. 
carers sometimes tend to be quite vague. They say that uh, he's been really depressed, he's been quite psychotic. Um, it's kind of important to break that down into what do you mean by depressed? Because depressed and psychotic for the layman is quite different from depressed and psychotic from a medical point of view. So you've got to ask them, so when you say that they were depressed, what do you mean? Were they feeling really low? Were they eating? Were they drinking? What were they doing? And they'd be like, oh, he was just sad, but then, you know, he was going out for movies and stuff like that, but he's just depressed in, in general. So you've got to kind of, kind of break it up. And psychotic, a lot of people describe psychotic as something that, oh, he's just psychotic, he doesn't really want to listen, he's crazy, I'm doing all this for him and he doesn't appreciate it. Yes, but that's not really psychotic. So you want to find out the behavior. You want to get out as to what exactly was happening and you can be a judge of that. So you just want a description of events and you can judge that sort of thing and you can come to a conclusion as to whether that's psychotic or not as to them just saying stuff. I would say the most important thing is to keep in mind to quantify the time periods of what they're telling you because people will tell you all sorts of things and imply that they've been going forever or are an immediate problem and their time scale will be very far off what is clinically relevant. Collateral history can come from a variety of places. Um, the immediate people that you'd want to sort of contact is the next of kin, whoever's um, close to the patient, but it, it doesn't mean it necessarily has to be family. Um, it can be friends, it can be the GP, it can be a confidant, someone that knows this patient quite well. And you won't know who that person is until you speak to the, the patient. Um, once you identify that person, uh, I think regardless of the time of the day, especially when you get presentations late at night, get on the phone and call. It's better to have the information than to not have it, even if you've got to wake someone up. Unless it's a doctor, then, then you can wait. The other question that I ask them is, why do you think this is happening? And I ask it as a very open statement because the family will give you things that will be critical for the formulation in understanding the whole presentation. So they could say, oh, it's a part of work stress um, or relationships not going well, or we suspect that they may be using substances again. It could be anything, um, and that's why I deliberately ask it as an open question. In a lot of instances, what our patients tell us may seem to be possible in real life, may seem to be the truth, um, or they may kind of mask a lot of what's happening with them, or two, they may not even know what's happening or how they're behaving. So kind of collateral history is, is kind of important and sometimes it um, makes or breaks the diagnosis that you actually give the patient. The other bit of advice I would give in terms of getting collateral is um, try and see who the people that have had immediate contact with the patient before coming in. Um, so sometimes a GP, a psychologist, someone who's had something to do with the patient's mental health and care of their mental health before coming into hospital can be quite a wealth of information, especially in that presenting complaint um, type arena. Then, to help with risk assessment, I ask, what are your concerns? Again, as a very open question. They go through a lot of stress, and I think it's always good to just check with them, are you doing all right? Do you have any sort of supports? Um, is there anything that we can do for you? And stuff like that. And. Um, a lot of times when we're speaking to family, there is this um, conflict between the team's view and the family's view. The family are like, oh no, you can't discharge them, um, especially with personality disorders. You can't discharge them. She's saying this, so he's saying this. And um, that's when we've got to hold that frustration. There's no need to um, disagree with them, say, look, I understand where you're coming from. That's a completely reasonable point of view to have as a carer, as a mother, as a parent. Um, but then you've got to say, and, and the best defense is like, look, we've got to fall back to a mental health act. If, if we can't detain them under the mental health act, and if she doesn't want to stay, we've got no grounds to hold them. And instead of taking that and you're just like, use the mental health act to your advantage as well. Like, um, and, and that's true. If you can't detain them under the act and they don't want to stay, you, you we're not law enforcement or we can't just keep people in indefinitely, it's not our job. I think it's really important to give the family members an opportunity to, often it's to vent, 
an opportunity to um, articulate all of their concerns because they're probably very scared by the situation. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of emotions that come up uh, when you've got a, a relative in hospital, um, and so by gaining that collaborative history, there's a lot of validation that goes through that um, as well. That's important. I understand that this can be really hard for you. I hear that you're stressed. I hear that um, things haven't been easy recently. And then probably the only other question that I have is, what I I ask, what treatment do you think you know, so and so needs, or what do you think would be most helpful now? And I keep it open because the family might say, well, actually, we think the core issue is alcohol use. Or we think the core issue is managing stress. So that helps you tailor treatment quite quickly. A few of them might tell you, like for patients who've been on medications for a while, oh, they were the best when they won that medication. And they have a lot of information, so things about when was he best, like what period was he best, what was happening in his life then and things like that. Aside from that, when you're speaking on the phone, um, try and keep it a bit of an open dialogue, but be respectful to the patient's privacy as well. Sometimes people you're getting collateral from may not be the people that they've nominated, but under um, the, the Mental Health Act and duty of care, you can obtain that information in a one-way basis. So if that is, make sure you stipulate that on, on the phone call that you, you're calling for the, for the best interest of the patient and you want to keep the information just one way at this stage. And, and a lot of people, if you tell them that, will be very understanding. It's important to make sure that you're, you're getting your corroborative history with the consent of the patient um, and or if they haven't given their consent that you um, are just gaining history rather than... Um, telling them information about the patient. I think a lot of female families just feel comforted by acknowledgement of their distress even if they don't do anything. So just acknowledging and listening to them sometimes is good enough. And always consult them when discharge planning. Always. And don't give them a shock. You don't want the patient coming up at the door and saying, hi mum, I'm back home. You want them to know. If you're trying to get a patient to go home, you want to spend a lot of time asking the family how they're doing and focusing on the progress of the patient. And if that patient is ready to go home and you're focusing on the good things, that's a good place to start because then the family won't be taken off guard or become defensive when you start talking about discharge planning. As well as if they've got a chronic issue, it's good to highlight that to the family, you know, whether or not an acute inpatient unit is the appropriate place to treat that chronic issue and talking about follow-up and things that the patient will get if that's going to be happening because they find that, you know, you don't want to put these people off. You don't want them to be defensive or, you know, avoiding what you're saying or panicking on the other side of the phone. You want to do your best to give them a clear picture of why you're doing what you're doing.